Hello, this is Mark Tooley, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy with another episode of Marxism with fellow Marx and fellow editors Mark Leibecki and Mark Melton looking at three pieces in Providence uh, this week. One from our contributor Rebecca Heinrichs responding to Pentagon spokesman John Kirby's emotional reaction to Russian brutalities in Ukraine and tying that to America's traditional commitment to just war keeping. A piece in or from, I should say, Christianity in Crisis magazine 75 years ago about the Chinese Civil War. And finally, my own piece about Ukraine as the new martyr nation of the 21st century. But first, starting with Re Rebecca Heinrich's piece, uh, Mark Lebecki is just war scholar. Your thoughts in terms of Rebecca's tying John Kirby's emotional reaction to our traditional adherence to just war teaching. Yeah, as, as always, I think Rebecca, it, it's a great piece. It's prescient, uh, it's insightful. John Kirby is, has uh, impressed me from the beginning in all of this. He, he seems to get it. Uh, in that sense, I think he embodies the, the, the best of American uh, foreign uh, political aspirations. I think what Rebecca touches on um, in responding to Kirby's emotional, his own emotional response to images uh, that he has seen of Russian atrocities, what she's touching on is the, the fact that as Augustine says, uh, you know, emotions are embodied uh, reason. Uh, they, they, they have an epistemological value. They teach us things. We have to be careful with them, of course, uh, but our emotions help us to understand the conditions of the world. I experienced this in my, in my own Christian conversion, which I've talked a lot about both in writing and in lectures uh, and an encounter with the Holocaust and a recognition that overwhelming evil is something that ought not to be and that Christianity has to have some sort of a response to this, that we, have it, you know, we can't be so simply concerned about heaven uh, that there are no implications for or responsibilities uh, for our time on earth. I think Christianity uh, recognizes that. Christianity has a response to political evil. We see it uh, in the beginning of Genesis where God demands uh, an accounting for shed blood. We see that all the way up through uh, the motivations and passions of the prophets. Uh, we see it in the Sermon on the Mount. We're all called to be peacemakers. And we recognize that being a peacemaker sometimes means entering into conflict. And so from that tradition, the just war tradition uh, takes its own bearings and it recognizes that uh, there are evils in the world and that the human um, soul uh, is made in the image of a God that demands that injustices be requited. And then she touches on the fact that the, the, the just war tradition doesn't suppose itself to be a set of rules for rule followers. Uh, following the Niberian insight, the just war tradition is, is grounded in the fact that human beings are not, in fact, rule followers. And we need guidance all the time because left to our own devices, um, we may give in to our disordered loves and our, 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 our passions. And so the, the just war framework is, is a mode of both trying to goad us toward our responsibilities as well as restraining us um, from an excess of, of passion. And she touches on all those things. And I think that's part of the beautiful insight, not just of Christian realism, but very specifically of one of its greatest products, which is just war realism or moral realism. Um, and then finally, I think she's right. You know, uh, uh, America doesn't get things right all the time. Of course we don't, um, because America is made up of a bunch of human beings. Uh, but the simple fact that time and time again, um, as a people and as a nation, we are motivated um, by a desire to do good, uh, to avoid harm, and to help where we can. I think that um, I think that cuts to the heart of, of American virtue. I think it's why our power has long been sufferable to those who are beneath it, because we've demonstrated at least a desire to be a force for good. And as Kirby said, that is emphatically not Putin's motivation, which has made him a pariah. Perhaps a topic for a future conversation, whether or not Eastern Orthodoxy has a just war tradition and to what extent Russia has ever historically heeded it. Um, I don't know if you have any expertise in that area, Mark, but perhaps you can well, do some research for our next conversation. 
Yeah, we certainly can. I mean, you know, anecdotally, I I, I remember uh, speaking with some Serbian friends during the American bombing uh, in Serbia during the Kosovo operation. And they were boasting, I think I've said this before, they were boasting about um, thwarting American jets by uh, having rock concerts on bridges and holding signs that said, shoot me, knowing that we wouldn't blow up those bridges if there were people on them. And I simply asked them if, uh, and they were quite proud of this, saying they defeated the American Air Force with rock concerts. And I asked them if they would have done the same thing if it was the Soviets or the Russians flying overhead. And they were just aghast at the idea and thought I was a lunatic because don't I know the Russians would simply bomb the, the bridges anyway. So yeah. That's there's a partial answer to the question. <laughs> partial answer. Anecdotal. Well, I think on that particular question, I remember hearing that uh, Orthodox doesn't have that same Western other than like self-defense, but it doesn't have the same tradition. But I, I've, I think I've heard that from other Eastern Orthodox and yeah, other. It's not as codified or as articulated as such. Right. Is that there is a good book like by uh, our own um, uh, Daryl Charles and, or no, Daryl Cole, I'm sorry, uh, and Alexander Webster. Alexander Webster is, if I remember this book correctly, uh, Eastern Orthodox himself, and this book has something to say. It's called The Virtue of War. I commend it. Well, very good. On a related topic, I wrote a piece for Providence this week on uh, Ukraine as a new martyr nation, Poland having been uh, arguably the supreme martyr nation of the 20th century, having suffered uh, almost uh, beyond comprehension, recovering its independence in the wake of World War I, but only briefly uh, suffering the highest casualties uh, during World War II, a victim of both the Nazis and uh, of Soviet communist and yet inspiring the world with their heroism <laughs> and their resistance uh, in my own lifetime, the solidarity trade union movement, which uh, almost uh, by itself brought down Soviet control of Eastern Europe combined with the uh, spiritual influence of uh, Poland's favorite son, Pope John Paul II. And so uh, terrible, terrible suffering. Poland lost uh, perhaps 6 million people in World War II, uh, and yet this suffering, in a way, uh, contributed to their strength as a nation, but also as a, an inspiration to the whole world, what a courageous and unified people can accomplish. And Ukraine seems to be serving in the same way for the 21st century, um, again, not having a long national history in contemporary times, but yet surely after this trial, will be a unified and strong nation and its sufferings and agonies, horrible as they are, are an inspiration and a motivation to others around the world to strive for an improved national life and to take our own national security much more seriously. I recall some decades ago, uh, then Cardinal O'Connor of New York, uh, I believe he was visiting Auschwitz, but he cited the Holocaust as having been the Jewish people's quote unquote, great gift to the world. Uh, of course, this relates to the Christian understanding of suffering as being a gift. Obviously, we worship a savior whose greatest gift to us was his own suffering. His comments were greatly uh, controversial at the time, understandably, and somewhat misunderstood. So I'm reluctant to repeat that same talking point with Ukraine, and yet their suffering is, in many ways, a great gift to at least the, the decent and rational parts of the world. But Mark Levecki, your thoughts? I think that's right. I, yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot to be said there. Um, you know, if you wanted to put you know the nuance to it, it's not their suffering per se, but it's how they're enduring their suffering. Um, and for sure, my own Christian conversion, hearkening back to a conversation a moment ago, um, involved watching how or observing how Jews at places like Auschwitz um, remained Jewish. Um, they recognized that they might not have any say in whether or not they died at the hands of Hitler. But they had a lot of say whether or not they died as Jews, um, observing, um, uh, you know, fasting on Yom Kippur, um, even when starving to death um, and, and committed to dying as Jews. So how one suffers can be an inspiration and a light to the nations. And I think um, I think both are true. And speaking of suffering, uh, Mark Melton, you have posted this piece from Reinhold Niebuhr's magazine. 75 years ago, about the, the uh, Chinese Civil War, the uh, communists had not yet taken control. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek was still uh, chief of nationalist 
mainland China and uh, American General Marshall had tried to negotiate uh, a concord between the two factions, not very successfully. The author uh, was sympathetic to the communist side, uh, which seems rather remarkable to us now, but which was not entirely uncommon uh, 75 and 80 years ago. Obviously, the Chinese communists under Mao had been uh, aligned with America against the Japanese. Uh, this author would later uh, change his perspective on the Chinese communists after uh, some years of uh, tyranny and horror. But uh, your thoughts? Yeah, so yeah, like you said, in this historical context, the communists and the U.S. were aligned together in World War II. Same thing with the Soviet Union. They were our ally. And so it was not unheard of and very common for Americans to be siding with the communists. In fact, even after the war, if I remember correctly, there were American, I don't know if they were OSS, but agents um, in China working with the communists, want, basically arguing that we needed to side with, with them and not the nationalists, which became the Republic of China that's in Taiwan. And so uh, there's this argument, and the, Michael Lindsay, the author here, makes it that the communists could exist in a democracy, he thought. They, there was a division between the Soviets in uh, Moscow and uh, the communists in Yunnan, China. And so that you know, they could exist in a democracy and they could work together. And uh, of course, that's not how it turned out. And that um, there was, even though, even in Christianity crisis, there were writers who wanted to make a difference between the Russian Marxist and Marxist in other parts of the world you know, they ended up being um, hostile. And so in this, uh, Michael Lindsay is a very interesting character. And so he, you know, English, or I think he might be of Australian. I was confused in the documents whether his son was an Australian citizen or if he was an Australian citizen. But either way, his father, he was born in London, went to Oxford, taught in um, what is now Beijing and uh, met his wife there. Um, they had to flee into the... Uh, the mountainous controlled area of the communists. And he basically set up radio towers or he helped them with radio equipment and helped them broadcast. And so basically my rating of it is he's basically a communist propagandist during the war, um, trying to get their message out to the West. And so he's very sympathetic to their views. In this article that he writes in 47, he is very sympathetic to them. Basically, it sounds like the communists can do no wrong, according to him. If they do something wrong, it's because the nationalists did it first. And to be fair, the nationalists were very corrupt. Um, I believe, I can't remember if it was Chang's brother or his brother-in-law that was called one of the most corrupt people in the world. And so there were a lot of problems there, but at the same time, it was a very difficult situation. And what followed after the communist takeover was significantly worse with millions of deaths. And so um, later on, uh, this Lindsay guy, he, he teaches at Harvard. He teaches in Australia. He then becomes more anti-communist. He's you know, forbidden from returning from, to China until the 70s. He comes back to, or he comes to America. Uh, he teaches at American University, lives in Chevy Chase, Maryland. He inherited an estate in England and became a member of the House of Lords. So a very interesting character. I believe he died in Chevy Chase, Maryland in 1994. But anyway, so in this article, though, to kind of get back to that, he makes a lot of claims that are just bizarre to me. He says that 400,000 nationalist troops served in the Japanese forces against the communists, which is odd because they were fighting each other. But I do think that is something that if you are in knee deep in Chinese communist propaganda, you might believe that. I'm a little curious as to why Christianity in Crisis didn't fact check that or um, question it. And you know, a couple months later, there was a response. And so in this article, there's two pieces here, the longer one by Michael Lindsay, and then another one by A.J. Brace, who spent 25 years in Western China, and basically sets the record straight to say that, no, these Chinese uh, communists are not uh, friendly. Um, they're, they do a lot of nasty things. And that, you know, they are, uh, um, what's the quote here? Anyway, they're not going to be friendly with us. So uh, and I, I pose this piece not as an example of saying, hey, we should imitate, we should understand how Michael Lindsay viewed global affairs. He's an example of how we should look at the world. I 
posted it as a cautionary tale of how people can become captured by or they can be heavily influenced by the people they are close to and are studying so much so that they it warps the way they view the world and so we need to be cautious of that when you're studying um, different conflicts and different groups and we need to have good and healthy debate and I think the fact that Christianity crisis posts multiple views on China is an example of how that can be done. On that note, uh, on that uh, Christian realist note, uh, thank you for this latest episode of Marxism, fellow editors Mark Livecki and Mark Melton. Until next week, bye-bye. <laughs>